Bonjour à, à tout le monde, je suis professeur Yap Boum. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Professor Yap Boum, regional representative for Epicenter in Africa. I'm based in Cameroon, where I support the Ministry of Health for COVID response in operations in the framework of the implementation of the program. Today, we have the pleasure of having our first webinar organized by Epicenter that will try to answer to a question, rel relatively important questions on several prevalence. COVID-19, we live it on a daily basis the first cases arrived in February and March in the majority of countries. In certain countries, we had three phases, another four phases. We've seen the arrival of different variants. Uh, we've seen a situation that uh, surprised that the shocked us. We thought of uh, having a lot of, we, will, we would have a lot of cases, a lot of death. We also thought that the health system would crumble under the weight of the pandemic. But this has not been the case everywhere. What is important to highlight here is the, dif the difference uh, within the African country in the treatment of this pandemic and in the way the population have responded to that as well. But there are some questions that are still waiting an answer. So the uh, low number of cases that have been reported, are they due to a particular immunity of the African population or uh, other reasons? What happened? In order to respond to answer to these, we have been implemented survey in different countries and these will be presented today and discuss and we will have several panelists. We will start by Dr. Sala Isufo, a medical director of MSF Waka, West and Central Africa, that will tell who will tell us how an organization like uh, um, Doctors Without Borders um, has tackled this issue. Then we will receive some tools to better understand how these surveys are implemented, especially in a diagnostic with the different tests that are carried out to, in order to have the same understanding of the outcomes and results that we will see. Um, then we will have Antoine Kubar presenting the results in DRC, Kenya, Cameroon, Niger, and DRC in Kinshasa. We will uh, highlight what happened, and you will understand that in the minutes to come. We will have, uh, in the end, uh, Professor Pierre Congolo, who is a part of the consulting committee in Cameroon for vaccination, who will tell us how and why these results are important in the decision-making process of the different health ministries, and especially, namely, Sulu in Cameroon. So without further ado, I, I leave now the floor to Dr. Sala Isufu, Medical Director for uh, MSF in Waka, an entity that is uh, taking care of Western Central Africa for MSF. He is an expert on public health. And so the floor is yours. Uh, Dr. Isifu is speaking, but his mic is off. You are on mute, Dr. Isifu. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Professor Yep, for the introduction and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am uh, the director for uh, medical operations for uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders in Waka, uh, Central and West Africa. I am really happy and honored to be able to take the floor today to present 
why we had asked uh, these uh, surveys to be carried out, uh, several prevalence uh, studies. Um, we need to contextualize the situation, uh, first of all. I think that the first quarter of 2020 and the, uh, sorry, the second quarter of 2020 with the evolution of the epidemic and the declaration of the pandemic, uh, there were at the time a lot of questions that we had in respect to the African continent on the real situation. This came, I, I, I would, I would, uh, I would uh, find there are three questions. The first one is linked with the history of um, low use of uh, health services in Africa that makes us uh, uh, doubt on a non under reporting of uh, the cases and a strong epidemic in the community uh, seen in respect to, to the, all the cases that we've seen in Europe and in other continents and that are almost systematically reported by the media, but also through the social networks. This is the first element. The second element is uh, the low availability of um, verifiable data on uh, the extent of the epidemic of COVID in uh, Africa. Uh, namely, at the time, we didn't have any visibility on the attack rate. Mortality is unknown. And the third element is um, linked to the, the low access to diagnostic systems. And this uh, led us to uh, fear of a large span epidemic that was not reported by the health system that are in place uh, and that are based on the report of cases through the labs and the um, healthcare institutions. So this is with respect to the added value of this uh, survey. Uh, first of all, for Doctors Without Borders, I'd say this survey will allow us to fine tune our operation objectively on the basis of uh, the real risk in terms of death, number of deaths. Uh, for instance, we can ask ourselves how to allocate the resources on this environment uh, in between these uh, diseases and other high risk diseases like like uh, uh, malaria, Ebola, and so on and so forth. Um, the second outcome that we expect is uh, to identify some target groups that uh, the Ministry of Health or um, or uh, MSF could tackle as a response. And another important element is to be able to test the rapid test tools that we have available that could in time be used for the population we have a hard time to access um, for, I'm talking for MSF and for uh, healthcare in general. In respect to the attacks, in respect to all the measures that have been taking, the closing of the borders, the airports and so on and so forth, in respect to the healthcare authorities in the different countries, the advantage of these surveys is to be able to implement controls based on scientific evidence uh, brought forth by these uh, studies, starting by proof, real proof, taking into account the African realities. In other words, if we want to go further, if the seroprevalence study today shows a high rate of uh, people that have already been struck by the disease. The question of lockdown could be put, uh, could be reevaluated, reassessed, because uh, 
uh, the majority of the people that would be in lockdown have already sustained the sickness. So, uh, and we know that the financial and economic repercussion of lockdown is uh, really uh, deep on a really already fragile economy such as the African one. So the seroprevalence study could be a really valuable tool to um, uh, this for decision making for the public health uh, decisions taken by the country. So we will be discovering the outcomes and results of this uh, uh, survey of what we can learn from it, what we could uh, see eventually as an opportunity to intervene or readapt our intervention, uh, how to reorganize the operation for MSF, but not only that, also for the um, Ministry of Health. So thank you very much for this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Sala, for this uh, introduction. We do understand that data uh, were expected. There was a lot of expectation about uh, these uh, two in order to use it as a tool of decision making for the for MSF and for the country. I now leave the floor to Dr. Langta who will inform us on the different tests that have been used during these survey and the practical conditions. Celine is a biologist and epidemiologist that joined Epicenter in, 12, in 2011, and she is now working in on different clinic and she coordinates labs in Niger in, uh, and Uganda. She is a pharmacist by training and she has a master a degree on public health uh, hello hello ladies and gentlemen hello yep so this uh, first presentation will uh, show the serology assays uh, their difference uh, their very vari variability and their impact first of all let's look at the serological response to the sars cov, -CoV 2 infection there's a human response with uh, img uh, IG, uh, igm sorry igg aga uh, multiple SARS-CoV antigen targets, nucleocapsid protein spike proteins, epitopes, and receptors binding domain. This will impeach the penetration of the virus in the cell, and these are mainly anti-S and anti-RBD um, antibodies. You see here the kinetics of SARS-CoV-2 viral load antibodies uh, during acute infection, recovery, convalescence, and the duration of the response on IgG is what interests uh, us the most, but varies following several parameters that we will be seeing afterwards. The lowering of the IgG through time is linked to the waning effect of uh, antibodies. The methods of evaluation are really complex. Uh, certain parameters have an effect on the humoral response, especially age and symptoms, uh, increasing the antib antibodies in circulation. Persistence and decay of antibody response depend also on the type of antibody and the antigen target. As an example, we've taken this Japanese study showing that uh, in IgM uh, the response is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is less than IgG and they um, last less. Now let's move to the description of the serology assays in the arsenal of the lab tests for COVID-19. Besides viral detection, we have immune response detection, as you can see here. Serologic tests are very going from the more complex to the simplest. The neutralization assay uh, 
the tax at the neutralizing power, then we have fluorescence uh, tests, and then we have simple and rapid tests given a uh, negative or positive uh, outcome uh, in a few minutes. The sensitivity of these tests vary a lot. In a general way, we uh, think that uh, um, uh, these are the main ones that we can implement. These two studies, uh, as an example, can show us the impact and the variability of the outcome on, uh, on in, in terms of uh, seroprevalence uh, test results. In ZRC, on 562 healthcare workers, two tests have been uh, implemented and test ELISA showing 36% of positive outcome and a rapid test with a, a positivity of 13%. Only 8% were positive to both both tests. So two tests uh, aiming to detect the same antibody have really different uh, outcomes. Then a test carried out in Switzerland, a survey carried out in Switzerland, showing a difference from 4.2 to 6.4, depending on the test that was implemented. Other tests give a lower positivity rate. So similar tests aiming to detect different antibodies uh, give different outcomes. The sensitivity of the test also depends on timing. The eclair uh, of electrochemical lum luminescence show a, a difference in terms of the timing, a reinforcing thus of the antibody and antigen use in this technique. Let's now move to the specificity of these tests and their capacity to have as, as few less um, false positive as possible, even though there is a heterogeneity of uh, the test as you have seen before. In general, all these serological tests is, are confronted with endogenous uh, and cross reactivity. Starting through this uh, pre pandemic serum analysis, we look for pre existing IgG and IgM cross reactivity with SARS CoV 2. These data are rare coming from sub Saharan Africa. In Tanzania and in Zambia, uh, some result, some uh, tests would give uh, positive results on the anti-NCP. Again, so the results coming from the US. In Central Africa, uh, hundreds of uh, IgM cross-reactivity tests, they've given 1.4% uh, to 6.1% of the positive results. To go further in this study, in uh, the pre-pandemic serum, they've all, we found that all these pre-pandemic serum crossed with uh, uh, COVID-2 would um, activate the spike protein. So this shows that uh, that uh, w these tests can generate a lot of false positive that could be specific to these countries, like uh, Zambia and Tanzania, having a higher rate, uh, for instance, to the yes, showing an exposition to uh, um, a higher exposition to, uh, to, 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 to uh, depending on the countries. We have looked also for autoimmune markers and others illnesses markers and this list is not exhaustive is not complete so on the basis of all this data how can we choose the best test for zero prevalence as we saw the accuracy of serological results depend on many parameters. First of all, the type of test, the method, the type of antibody, the antigenic target, and then the specific population with symptoms in hospital, general population. The performance of most serological tests were based on the basis of serum of patients in hospital with symptoms, which is not really representative of uh, normal population that is uh, analyzed. And so that uh, explains uh, the uh, lower level of uh, performance in the test. And then there are some uh, personal individual parameter parameters, namely age, severity of symptoms, uh, 
the time after the infection, and then there are some other individual variability. That, for example, the, the decay of antibodies over time causes an underestimation of the real percentage of individuals that are infected. And so there is an underestimation. Considering all this limit, we need to consider, we need to decide what is the best test to use we can combine a sensitive test based on a spike protein and NCP. That enables us to minimize the potential contribution of false positive, and then it enables us to make a distinct, distinction between in natural infection and the seroactivity induced by certain vaccines. After some multiple tests, we increase specificity, but we reduce the sensitivity. And uh, namely, we do not uh, consider the waning effect of anti-IACP. So we, if you use multiple, multiple tests, we need, uh, we can uh, make an estimate of minimal seroprevalence and cumulative incidence uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 over time. While if we use a strategy with a single test with a good sensitivity, for example, anti-AIS, anti-ASAP, we would uh, include false positive and uh, we lose uh, sensitive sensitivity but we un we overestimate seroprevalence with this strategy we can make an estimate of the lim superior limit of seroprevalence and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, but the problem is that we do not have a correct uh, image of the circulation of the virus. So to finish, it is important to consider the multiple parameters that uh, play an active role in serological tests. And the most important thing is to think about the objective of such studies. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Celine, for your accuracy, as it is always the case. And now let's uh, start the next presentation by Etienne Gignou, who is going to share the result of uh, uh, an inquiry carried out in Cameroon, DRC, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Mali, Niger, Sudan, and Yemen. Etienne Gignou has been working with Epicentre for many years. He joined MSF in 2001. Then he became an epidemiologist and he's based in Geneva where he supports MSF in operations. He is very often on the field where he carries out studies and research on cholera and uh, other uh, important uh, uh, important topics. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for this presentation. Hello, everyone. I am going to speak about uh, the inquiries of zero on zero prevalence and retrospective mortality carried out by Epicentre and MSF in uh, uh, low income countries. On the third of December two thousand and twenty one, Africa and Yemen uh, declared. Uh, about uh, a bit more than 3% of confirmed cases, while they represent more than 18% of world population. So if we base, uh, if we only think about the confirmed cases of uh, reported by surveillance system, the attack rate is six times lower than the rest of the world, and even nine if we exclude the South Africa. And these, countries are characterized by a younger population and then uh, they are more likely they more uh, they have more habit more of the habit to tackle epidemics uh, they react more uh, quickly but uh, the population, as uh, we said, uh, is uh, younger, and there is a correlation between uh, the between uh, uh, the population and the case fatality. The model that we use uh, show that there is a risk of uh, uh, death that is ten times higher in Japan than in Kenya because of the role played by age. 
So we, bear, we had to bear in mind the characteristics of the population. And our main question was uh, that uh, was to know if uh, the lower number of cases uh, and of death is uh, really the real picture of the epidemics or at the, the, on the contrary, the magnitude of the epidemic is under evaluated, underestimated because there is a less, uh, a lower uh, deten detection capacity. So first, First of all, we analyzed, we assessed the rate of infection among blood donors to follow trends as a proxy for general population, then among health care staff working for MSF. Then we tried to analyze general population and infection rate to assess, to make an assessment of mortality rate. We used rapid tests, but also Eliza and Eklaya to improve our skills on the performance of such tests in such contexts. In general, general protocols have been developed for each type of inquiry, and we adapted to the context and constraints. There were three different types of inquiries on uh, for blood donors. We looked for the uh, an infection in the past with uh, antigen tests and serological tests. And for healthcare workers, we had uh, we used the same approach, but we also covered. Uh, we made inquiry on symptoms of COVID. While for general population, we used samples. It was a retrospective cross-sectional mortality survey with a nested seroprevalence survey. Then we also uh, asked people to fill in questionnaires. And we selected uh, some households in a systematic way, we gave them a questionnaire, as I said, and then uh, uh, we used samples, blood samples on the blotting paper to make analysis of these uh, samples. We have adopted this approach for inquiries on population with the, the exception of the, the Gale camp because for security reasons that was not possible. For the inquiry on mortality, the questionnaire was given to household uh, um, heads uh, with uh, a recall period. So before and after the pandemic, the size of samples was uh, uh, reduced to detect a higher rate of mortality. And the result was that there was a higher mortality among people with um, in their 50s and, uh, uh, and older. We decided to prioritize context and the populations that uh, with uh, for those uh, there are less information and data available so we carried out an inquiry on blood donors uh, in uh, msf center in aden in yemen from december 2020 and march 2021 you can see the uh, in the table the curb of cases the the evolution of cases at national level then there was another inquiry on blood donors in kutiala in mali in december from december 2020 and june 2021 then uh, two other inquiries on healthcare professionals, one in Yemen between September 20, 2020 and January 2021, and Maradi, Niger from March to April, March to April 2021. Then uh, some uh, other inquiries on general population in 2021 in the Gali refugee camp in Kenya if between February and March, in Dubon and in by Khartoum, which is a really crowded area. Then uh, in DRC from April to May, and then in Abidjan, two areas of, of Abidjan in Ivory Coast from July to November, and all the whole population of Cameroon in August. 
We focused on three topics, error prevalence in population in the different across different contexts by age range, and we're considering symptoms reported by seropositive people and impact of pandemic on the access of uh, to health care services and the impact of the pandemic uh, on mortality. Okay, as for blood donors, we uh, made a study, we carried out a study in the center, tra trauma center in Aden. In Mali, we included blood donors uh, of all the project, MSF in Kutiala. In Yemen, 199 participants without symptoms associated to COVID were included with just uh, RTD use for seroprevalence that was uh, uh, weak. In Mali, according to the result, there is a high zero prevalence if we based on the result of rapid test. In Mali, actually, we do not have a clear uh, trend. As you can see at national level, at lower uh, right. So the results are not that significant. In Yemen, zero prevalence was uh, low while uh, the official cases were really increasing. And so we can conclude that uh, a longitudinal follow-up of zero prevalence among the blood donors uh, uh, does not offer really uh, a reliable data. Then Maradi in Niger, we included healthcare professional work, working in the local hospital. Zero prevalence was 42% with the RTD and 85% with the, on the basis of ELISA lab test. While at the same time, very low cases were uh, had been officially declared. Seven people out of 92 who had accepted to be tested by PCR test were uh, tested positive. Among uh, healthcare professionals uh, in the trauma center in MSF uh, uh, Aden, uh, we carried out a screening on uh, personnel and staff with 19 people, 19% 19 of uh, people tested or staff tested positive. Zero prevalence. Uh, Zero prevalence by rapid test had decreased by 8%, uh, percent, while a client test had a, a result of 59%. And so there was a, a reduction in sensitiveness, sensitivity over time of a rapid test. In, in inquiries in population of zero prevalence and retrospective mortality were included in a, a wide a sample. More than 50,000 people have been tested by rapid test uh, uh, across the five uh, inquiries. There was there was a really low refusal rate, uh, while in Lubumbashi in Abidjan uh, there was a refusal uh, reviews the rate much higher. Okay, here you can see the result of the anti prevalent test by rapid test of inquiry of the population, just including people who were not vaccinated based on the presence of IgM and IgG. The estimates of zero prevalence go from 5.8% in Dagale refugee camp to 34.3% in Khartoum. For Abidjan, we are carrying out the last verification of data. That is why we can't share, we can't disclose the data for the moment. Now, Cameroon, a really large area. You can see that there is a, a big variation among different areas uh, with estimates uh, going from 4.5% to 17.6%. And also the surveillance system had more or less the same data, the same disparity. When it was possible, we also carried out an estimate in zero prevalence with uh, ELISA Wiklaya test. Because of practical uh, constraints and security reasons, we could not carry out these lab tests in the refugee camp in the Gali. In all just uh, um, 
samples uh, we we use samples to validate our rdt test and uh, uh, we are still analyzing cameroon uh, data the result showed that uh, the lab tests have much bigger figures than uh, uh, rapid tests seroprevalence tend to increase with age which was very much the case in Auburn and also in Lubumbashi in Cameroon and a bit less to a less to a low extent in the Gali. that is not the case for Ivory Coast because seroprevalence is more or less the same across all ages we can see that in no in no uh, area population of uh, 50 years old and uh, older uh, was uh, uh, did not have infection i mean most of them had infection which is really worrying because we are speaking about uh, the population that has most risk with the exception of abidjan several prevalences is statistically significant uh, a bit uh, higher for women than men another important factor another risk factor associated with seropositivity is the presence of a member of the household that is uh, who is positive in Nagali, we also analyze uh, all healthcare workers and midwife, traditional midwife, they were included, and we could observe a zero prevalence that was uh, uh, almost twice higher than population and their households. You can see in here a zero prevalence. Uh, zero prevalence in the different across different inquiries and all inquiries show that a proportion of people who have been infected by virus and uh, if they I mean, there were much more a higher, much higher attack rates of confirmed case in uh, in the countries where such inquiries were carried out. So, but what we do not know is that if such people also showed some symptoms, that is why we, we also included a questionnaire. And uh, the aim of this questionnaire was to know if people also had uh, COVID-19 associated uh, symptoms. And uh, people, seropositive people reported more symptoms uh, than people who were seronegative. <laughs> then as for access uh, to healthcare, we can we could uh, also see a correlation between uh, the access to healthcare and pandemic admissions to hospital consultation decrease by um, almost a third we could also see that in all inquiries uh, thanks to the interviews in household the proportion of deaths at home increased with the pandemic you can see before pandemic in blue and uh, during pandemic depths uh, in gray. This leads us to the following topic, which is mortality. In uh, most of the uh, survey, we see more mortality uh, before uh, after the pandemic than after the pandemic. You see the mortality in blue before the pandemic and in red during the pandemic. This pandemic, this mortality rate is uh, 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 nevertheless underneath the uh, emergency threshold for uh, the humanitarian um, institutions. You see here that mortality rate for 50, 50 plus years of age people uh, is increased. We so we focus on the study uh, that we focus here on the study that has been carried out in Lumenbashi. 
In Lumenbashi, we have implemented a, a, a uh, survey for uh, the disease in the cemeteries. Uh, these causes are quite evident of people of 60 plus of age. We see peak for each uh, of uh, each wave of uh, the pandemic. So this shows a link to the uh, to the disease. These are confirmed uh, in uh, the second wave, but less so in the first wave. Uh, in uh, in on the on the graph on the right we have uh, put the, the uh, cases of death where it could have been misrepresented as covid on the graph on the um, on the on the top you see a suggestion of a direct impact of covid-19 but we see another uh, age group as well especially those are on the need 20 years of age and between 10 and 20 so this mortality could be linked not only to the uh, sickness in itself but to the pandemic we also question the households on how uh, people died and symptoms before a death. Most frequent reported comorbidities in Dagane, you can see here, and uh, you can see the comorbidities and the symptoms in the in the graphs. These studies shows that uh, the people in, infected by the virus. Uh, was uh, had symptoms, all the group were not spared. For instance, in France in 2020, when detection was, was in Stibia, you have several hundreds of reported cases. Uh, so we see that several positive uh, people, especially in uh, lower group ages, uh, have had symptoms. So we see that this continent has been spared more than our one. These uh, shows also that uh, higher age groups have been the ones who have sustained the most impact of the pandemic. So the 50 plus uh, years are not spared. This is worrying because uh, these are the people who normally have several comorbidities and uh, several fragilities in terms of health. And these are represented either in the communities or in the healthcare structure. We see a several prevalence in households with these kind of people. As you've seen in the presentation, the results of lab tests and rapid tests give a different outcomes, different results. Selena has had the occasion to look into this, but using one or another test, value are higher, but the number of cases is the same uh, and uh, circumstances are the same. So uh, more uh, um, higher age people are more impacted. Throughout our uh, survey, we uh, have uh, highlighted a reduced access to health care. This is uh, due probably, but there are some disparities and need further research. This is due uh, to the possibility of access of household to health care in uh, normal cases. But, and also, not all health institutions have been impacted at the same way. We need further research to see the impact of the pandemic on the access to health care. This reduction of uh, access is one of the factors that may be contributed to the uh, higher rate of the death or mortality. We are among the rare uh, example of uh, looking for seroprevalence and mortality at the same time. Um, in Lumobashi, in Cameroon, this suggests a direct impact of um, the uh, the disease on a particular uh, age group, especially. 
but they, we do not have a clear report of the deaths strictly linked to COVID-19. So uh, we can consider that it is a combination, a combination of the sickness in itself and dif difficult of accessing the health uh, system, health, health care. Uh, the limits are a long recall period in, in the cause of death reported. It is also important that uh, to understand that the situation might be uh, deeply more uh, severe than we uh, see and, and, and we understand. So the virus circulates in all the contexts where we're working, increasing mortality and a sickness. Despite of that, we are uh, not aware of all these uh, healthcare uh, challenges. So we do not want to define priorities for the public health, but to give the most objective vision possible to all stakeholders and population. Of course, all uh, remains open and we are uh, open to discuss with you um, about this after uh, the webinar. I'd like to acknowledge and to thank all the people that you see here on the screen that participated in this survey and uh, namely and especially Yap Boom and Elka Simon, Erica Simons took, that took part, who took part in this uh, survey, participated in the assessment and analysis. And uh, without them, this presentation wouldn't have been possible. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Etienne, for this presentation. Really interesting and per pertinent, showing a diverse, large diversity, but also a number of leads and common threads. We will remain now in Central Africa. Antoine Kuba, supervisor in the microbiology sectors of the university. Master uh, obtained master degree obtained in Seoul, uh, finished his studies in France, and mainly in charge of uh, infectious disease, viral disease, serologic uh, surveys in Kinshasa. But before that, he worked on uh, yellow fever, for instance. Please, the floor is yours, Doctor Nkoba. Thank you very much, Professor Yap for giving me the floor. I'd like to start by thanking all the organizers of this forum who have given us uh, the pleasure of being with you and sharing with you these uh, quite interesting results on the seroprevalence studies that we've carried out in DRC in Kinshasa in its capital. Okay. Now, finally, our presentation will follow the organization that you see on the screen. After a short introduction, we will be presenting the results in Kinshasa, and then we will finish with a discussion and lesson learned from uh, the surveys that we have carried out. Since its inception, its beginning in 2019, COVID-19 uh, arrives in waves and uh, and it impacts all the continent. More than 200 million, 200 million cases have been reported and more than 5 million deaths throughout the world. Based on the uh, contagiousness of uh, the sickness and uh, calculating its uh, uh, reproduction rate, which is superior to one, we see we have carried out a modeling studies for estimation of cases, uh, highlighting more than 70 million cases and more than 3 million death in the first year of circulation of this virus in Africa. In a DRC, uh, the first case of uh, COVID-19 has been reported uh, the 10th of March 2020 in Kinshasa and six months later, the 19th of October, only 11,078 cases have had been reported in uh, and, and among this, 8,219 in Kinshasa, showing us a large heterogeneity 
in between what was forecasted by mathematical models and what was reported by the PCR. The low, capa uh, low testing capacities in Africa for, of the labs in Africa combined to the uh, unawareness and on recognition, the, the population resistance could explain this disparity. So to uh, measure the span of the sickness, uh, the WHO had uh, recommended to carry out uh, seroprevalence uh, studies in African countries. It is in this framework that we created the ARIA COVA project funded by the French Development uh, Agency and supported by the IRD in collaboration with uh, uh, local reports in Senegal, Guinea, Ghana, Benin, Cameroon, and the DRC. This project aimed namely to reinforce the lab capacities and to carry out several prevalence studies for SARS-CoV-2 in order to determine the spread of this uh, disease. So the local team have had material and methodological support in order to be efficient in these seroprevalence studies. Now, for uh, what has been done in DRC, this uh, survey has been done from the 24th to the 8th of November uh, 2021 for two weekends, so all over four days in total. And we realize, as it has been realized, as you have, as you see here, after the first wave of uh, COVID in uh, DRC and at the beginning of the second wave. It is thus a uh, general population uh, survey, and the sample was of 1,020 individuals. In order to be able to use this results for the population, we have a three-stage selection. First of all, we have randomized 14 over the uh, 35 health zone in zones in the town in the city of Kinshasa. These zones are um, divided in two parts. The east part that had reported at the time not many cases of COVID, and the west area, which was uh, which held uh, most cases of re most reported cases of COVID. At the same time, we had a uh, random selections of health areas, 21 health areas in total over 380. And third stage, we also randomly um, chose some households in the, the health areas, so nine, 290 in total. As you can see on this uh, slides, in these uh, households, uh, 1,233 on more than 2,400 2, were present and accepted to take part to our survey. The survey has been done Thus, uh, lab analysis have been uh, realized on uh, serum samples that have been collected, and we use uh, the its XMAP uh, technology with the Luminex. Luminex is a cutting edge uh, technology. It, and its method allowing to identify several antigen in a same in the same reaction and in this precise precise case we have mixed a spike and a nucleoprotein which are the most immunogen uh, immu um, immunogen sorry uh, antigen uh, the this has been calculated using more than a thousand of pre-pandemic samples that have been had been collected and that we found and collected in Africa in DOC in Cameroon and in Guinea and by implementing our positivity criterion uh, which consists to have at the same time a reactivity uh, the in between the spike and the nuclear protein 
um, antigen, we had calculated a specificity of 90 seven uh, percent this has been done on a sample known to be uh to having been victim of uh, covid 19 and the analysis or the assessment of these tests has given a sensitivity and a specificity around 100 percent the results of this uh, survey have issued in a paper that you can find in the CID uh, the several prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 adjusted on the basis of age was of 16.6 percent with a uh, intervals as you can see here the several prevalence of uh, people of higher age, as you can see here in the graph, uh, 40 years of, of age were was a uh, uh, superior increase to younger people. So in respect to the general population, seroprevalence was higher than the attack rate. So 92 um, uh, in uh, 292 to one case ratio. So we have estimated that more than 2,000 infections had uh, occurred after the first wave in Kinshasa. When we look at the several prevalence uh, in respect to the geography of the area, we see that the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 to the west, the region that had reported most of the cases after the first wave, this several prevalence was higher to the one uh, in the east of uh, the uh, country. But uh, the difference was not statistically significant. It was of 18 and 14 percent, suggesting a quite homogeneous diffusion of SARS-CoV-2 in uh, despite all the measures that have been implemented in the areas. We have developed finally a logistic uh, model to include uh, different variables as uh, gender, age, and hospitalization. And we have implemented tests to highlight the degree in, to, in between the key variants and the seroprevalence. As you can see here in this graph, the gender, the age, and hospitalization were not significant uh, as when associated to several prevalence in our study. As you can see, thanks to this inquiry, we could see that after the first wave, zero prevalence was more than 17%. This is a zero prevalence was in the same at the same level as Zimbabwe with 19 and 10 percent in Mali. Zero prevalence in blood donors in Kenya was about six percent. But we can see that the zero prevalence inquiry in blood donors in Kenya was carried out at the beginning of the spreading of uh, COVID uh, in Africa. We could also see that inquiries carried out after the second wave in Zimbabwe and Mali reported uh, zero prevalence uh, figures three times higher than uh, those reported after for the first wave. So 53 and 54%. So what can we learn from uh, the, these uh, inquiries? As uh, we have just shown, thanks to our inquiry in Kinshasa, we could observe a, a big uh, spreading of uh, the disease in comparison to official cases. We could also see that uh, spreading was uh, sp spread in a different way in the different regions of the area. Infection was equally diffused along the capital city of DRC, for example, despite the containment measure imposed. So these data suggest a possible immunization of the 
population by natural infection. If that is the case, the proportion of uh, immunization seems to be more than 5% of vaccinated people at this time. Mortality linked to COVID-19 seems to be lower. In our study, it was zero in comparison to zero prevalence. But in spite of that, we could see that uh, infrastructure were overwhelmed, especially in Kinshasa. In a context of shortage of vaccines, the zero prevalence data can help decision makers uh, information to be more effective. That is the end of my presentation. I would like uh, to thank uh, the ARIACOV investigation team members uh, who helped us and enabled us uh, to carry out this inquiry despite the difficult uh, uh, context. I would also like to thank uh, the teams uh, of uh, the uh, different labs that were involved in uh, the inquiry to implement the tests, but also for the lab uh, activity. Thanks a lot uh, again to Epicentre for this opportunity to share important information. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Nkuba. Now we are going to give the floor to the vice president of the consultative group of the vaccination center, but he is also vice president of the scientific uh, uh, council that was created after the spreading of COVID-19. Professor, the floor to you. I am replacing Professor Rose Lecke, and we are going to speak about the impact of zero prevalence studies on public health. I am going to make a few remarks to engage in a discussion to discuss uh, the relevance uh, of uh, such studies and the potential impact uh, of uh, zero prevalence studies. First of all, zero prevalence inquiries uh, are well known. They are quite standard. Because of such studies, it was possible to develop uh, public health programs. Uh, for example, the fight against HIV AIDS or viral hepatitis. Uh, and these programs could be possible thanks to zero prevalence studies and the resources were allocated to fight against such problems. Now, COVID-19 is evolving really rapidly with a short incubation period. And sometimes in most cases, actually, the clinical symptoms of this disease are quite, sh quite short over time. But uh, let me first uh, uh, go back to definitions that you perhaps already know. What is a zero prevalence survey? Zero survey, a zero prevalence. But especially zero surveillance, because with, with this disease, as everyone said, there is a difference between the official cases, reported cases, and uh, the infection, the, the real infection rate among population. So in because uh, many uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients actually do not have uh, any symptoms. So they, uh, people who do not have symptoms uh, uh, do not get tested because uh, they do not feel that they are ill. And then impact, uh, as I uh, define them, effect or influence. But I would like to define the three dimensions of public health, the three pillars. Uh, Prevention, first of all, 
but also organization of response. I would also like to stress the notion of informed choice that must be made. So all these studies aim at understanding better the disease to better uh, to improve organization of uh, the response. As you already said, there are different factors that are analyzed. For example, the uh, immune the immune, immune response due to natural infection or vaccination, for example. And then uh, another type of survey could be to assess prevalence or incidence of infection, assessing response to vaccination. We could, we can already, we cannot, uh, really make uh, any, we cannot ma make any declarations on, uh, uh, I mean, we um, uh, our data are absolutely in evolution because uh, we should bear in mind there are many fake news uh, uh, speaking uh, about this. So zero prevalence and zero service can have an impact. First of all, because they provide information about the population immunity profiles. That is the first element. That is the first uh, uh, objective. Now, it takes time to get results. But what is the relevance of such results once they are available? It is, it is also possible to carry out a zero prevalence inquiries to, to assess uh, the performance of vaccines. Is it necessary to, to have a second dose or a further dose? Or is the vaccine effective against the new variant? Or is it possible to identify population uh, categories at risk, for example, healthcare professionals? Uh, but uh, more important, uh, it, these uh, inquiries um, guide immunization policies and strategies uh, and help monitor population immunity over time. And that is most, uh, that is very relevant at the moment. So speaking about the last two points, I think that uh, the inquiries that you've uh, spoken about have had uh, um, an impact in terms uh, of uh, target populations and uh, vaccination strategies. So uh, categories of population that need to be prioritized. So that is the type of impact of uh, zero prevalence uh, inquiries. Now, speaking about the disease, First of all, we need to raise a question. What is uh, the percentage, the attack rate of the general population who has been uh, uh, infected by the disease? What is the fatality rate of uh, the disease? Well aware that fatality rate is, is much weaker is much lower in our countries in comparison to other countries. What is uh, the spreading rate of uh, the disease? Uh, we already have some data about uh, uh, the spreading rate, the quickness, uh, on the basis of the results after the first wave and second wave. And we do not know what happened with the Delta variant now. Now, quarantine or uh, lockdown measures uh, have been implemented in different uh, ways across countries. But in any case, uh, zero prevalence uh, inquiries can have a big impact in uh, health uh, related policy and policies. But what are the requirements uh, 
for the relevance of impact and impact. First of all, we need it is important to have a collaboration and an inter interaction between decision makers, epidemiologists, and uh, laboratory scientists, and also funders. Or they, they need to decide what kind of survey uh, will be implemented, what is the target population, what is going to be the implemented method, because uh, we know that in some cases, uh, healthcare, access to healthcare is uh, uh, limited, and this should also be considered. So decision makers need to be involved in the designing of uh, the survey. For example, for Cameroon, the survey was an, at national level, and that means that we can draw many lessons from this survey, but it is important to have some procedures, some standard procedures. And uh, we need to make sure that data are reliable. So that uh, zero prevalence survey can really inform uh, decision and give data to decision makers, uh, such a service need to be absolutely uh, reliable. And uh, because uh, they can uh, give data to carry out uh, the best strategy for a specific context. For example, a zero prevalence uh, service can uh, also give information to decision makers about uh, new lockdowns or new quarantines. And uh, such decisions need to be integrated at a local level. And this is the same, this is the case at district level, regional level, or national level. Now, after assessing all the results, I, I don't know if it is really possible to have uh, an impact, but I I am going to speak about uh, some uh, limitations or, or concerns. Uh, first of all, it takes a, a really long time to get results. So when uh, you are in the middle of a crisis uh, uh, pandemic, it is not really easy to carry out such studies uh, and wait for the results. Uh, decisions uh, as a result need to be taken really quickly. It is not always easy to plan and uh, to manage resources. People are in panic. And then there is another element. Speaking about vaccines, one of the questions that are raised by such studies is, uh, is it possible to use zero prevalence surveys to estimate uh, the level of uh, immunization among population when we see that immunity is not necessarily a protection factor and that challenges our previous ideas about such tests. And then we also need to bear in mind that the design of uh, zero prevalence studies are not always uh, consistent, and that is important. Speaking about uh, public health care, the, the organization needs to make sure that the ob that the objective of the study are absolutely clear and that the methodological approach are reliable. because there is a, uh, there are many factors that need to be taken into consideration. And then the fourth point is uh, how to inform decision making amid, amidst of panic, uh, people who do not want to get vaccinated, distress, uh, fake news, uh, 
and then uh, inaccurate interpretations of all the information that is shared publicly. I have uh, received a um, remark by someone telling me, okay, there is 10% of people in Cameroon who haven't been affected, and uh, there are not so many deaths, and so that means that COVID-19 is not such a big deal. So that is to say that uh, we need to we need to be really uh, careful about uh, communication, the way in which we communicate, because people will use information, will interpret information in a different way. Now, to finish my presentation, it is really important that methods used in zero prevalence studies are standardized if we really want to integrate the results of such inquiries in uh, integrate with zero surveillance uh, and uh, to make sure that uh, such studies uh, give uh, information that can be relevant for decision makers it is important uh, to be able to an assess results rapidly give information once again uh, in a situation that is really um, a panic situation, people are in panic. And then I also wanted uh, to share something else with you. Actually, this is what I wanted to share with you, but please let me know if I wasn't clear. And. Uh, Thank you very much for these informations and perspectives. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. Uh, hopefully, we do not have a lot of time available. We have 10 minutes left on the timing that we had um, that was suggested. I hope that uh, many of you will continue to follow us. I will uh, start with uh, a question no, saying that the Omicron is uh, high and show a um, high rate of uh, transmission. Uh, so collective immunity could be a response to that. The answer is going to be, we still do not know because uh, we just uh, learned that immunity has a duration. And if immunity has a duration, it becomes really difficult to create recommendations uh, that are uh, solid and long lasting because the hypothesis that we have is that when we have a uh, immunity that last uh, lasts enough uh, we see the epidemic uh, lowering and ex examples like in england for instance well thank you very much there are other questions so i'd like to start uh, to throw a question asked to Celine. The first question is, apart from the controls that we could incorporate in uh, the COVID-19, are there any, any other means to control? And the other question from Jean-Paul is, what is your point of view? of uh, people said that were spared because uh, uh, they had some uh, comorbidities for um, respiratory disease. So yes, th thank you very much. So there are some quality control kits for serum, positive or negative. I'm talking about external labs. <clears throat> and uh, there are also um, controls sold by the supplier to the Elizabeth de Clia. So there are uh, other control, other means of controlling other than internal control for rapid tests. It is possible. Now, looking at the second question, it is an hypothesis. Uh, there are several others. One of the hypotheses is uh, that uh, population that uh, could uh, have a 
a Nancy body circulation anti coronavirus or similar diseases could uh, have been protected against uh, severe forms of the disease. We've seen in several surveys, people who was infected by coronavirus had a high rate of antibodies for other similar disease disease. So this cross contamination is uh, something that exists and is an hypothesis among others that could explain or at least participate to explain the fact to the fact that the, the Africa had less cases that we initially forecast. Thank you very much, Celine. For Etienne now, Florent, the Cam d'Agé uh, seems to be less impacted of other uh, other uh, sites that have been studied. Whereas uh, promiscuity is uh, really high here. Do you have any hypothesis uh, to explain that? And another question of Bresh saying that you think that uh, the results, the outcome of the several prevalence study uh, over age groups is uh, due to what kind of element? Oh, Etienne is speaking with his mic off. Etienne, we cannot hear you. Yes, sorry. I should have, you it should be used to this by now, but now to reply to Florent's question, maybe there are, there are several hypotheses. I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we were, a lot of worried about uh, uh, refugee camps or such a site uh, because of the promiscuity. There was this approach which, approach, which was the shielding of these populations. Uh, and this has been debated a lot. What is interesting to see is that, uh, that we've seen the protection that have has been carried out or the control of entries and exits, whether te systematic tests for all the people could lead to these, uh, to this uh, uh, lower several prevalence that we have uh, seen. Uh, that being said, this has uh, limits. Uh, this is uh, a uh, survey uh, that has been done in between two waves. Uh, with the, the second wave was starting when we carried out this uh, survey. So probably this camp was uh, spared because it is also isolated, it's quite isolated. So maybe there were not that, so many entries and exits and uh, not uh, such an expansion of the disease. There are other hypotheses. Uh, it's, uh, it's also a bio which is quite open. People are most of the time uh, outside, so that might be a reason as well. Now, so for the second question on the age, uh, there are several hypotheses. Celine is showing also the sensitivity uh, of the test uh, that increases with age. So maybe in the survey that we've uh, done, uh, we see the opposite. People of 50 plus, 60 plus years of age are uh, lower than um, than other age groups. And Pierre Mondira asked a question on uh, what could explain this, uh, this uh, higher. This is not clear in... Uh, we in certain area we know that age people have a, an important social role and social exposition so that could take part in the increase of the uh the 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 the, 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 the disease span in this age group thank you very much there's a remark saying that you said that the African continent has been spared more than others, but the question is not the number of cases, is the number of severe cases of the disease. 
and it seems that there are less severe cases in respect to Europe. Do you have something to say on this comment? Yes, it is an essential question. It is, it is quite difficult to say, to answer what we see is that it has not been, it, it has been spare so the age pyramid is quite different in uh, respect to industrial country this can change uh, the severe cases by tenfold with the same disease and same characteristic a complete different population in terms of uh, age uh, that's not why we've seen less several se se severe cases so I cannot answer to that. We tried to do that in the survey, but we couldn't. What we see is that we have a high mortality, nevertheless. Um, it's not like we would have a larger cholera epidemic. It's more discreet because uh, thank you very much, Etienne. There are two questions for Antoine. The first one as uh, somebody in charge of surveillance for COVID-19 COVID on DRC, we see important differences uh, in the number of reported cases and the several prevalence studies. So what are the orientation you could give to the surveillance uh, systems? And the second broader question is, are there African countries that uh, have at least 80% of antibody presence? Thank you very much, Professor Yep. This is a, an interesting question. The, for the first one, we have to say that in a country in DRC who had 13 Ebola epidemic, the first idea was to uh, had to, to, to use these uh, lessons uh, that we've had throughout all the Ebola epidemic and to use them for COVID-19. We have seen quite rapidly that that was not possible because the two, uh, these two pathologies are quite different and they have different dynamics. So we had to move to other uh, tip types of response. Seen the figures of the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in Kinshasa, we see that it is really important to be able to integrate a new way of uh, doing surveillance. For instance, improve the diagnostic uh, capacity, first of all, because uh, as of right now, there are only two, three centers or lab which have the skill and the technologies needed uh, to be able to analyze. So we need to diversify and increase the number of labs that can uh test and um, and give results on the other hand we also have to integrate the digitalized surveillance because uh community-based surveillance uh, showed its uh, limits whether digitalized surveillance since everybody has a smartphone is it easier to follow the cases and to uh improve uh, the surveillance and also to find uh, the implication in the community or in the communities uh, to the response. If uh, the communities are implicated in the response, uh, things can get easier. The second question is really important because here we've uh, carried out several prevalence uh, surveys do not have direct uh, they do not show directly the the what's present in the population because uh, most of uh, most of what we have highlighted are binding antibodies not uh, it was not done through they are not neutralizing 
antibodies. So we have an image of the spread of the of the disease, but not an image of the immunization effect on the population. So quite rapidly, some surveys and studies that we carried out, uh, which are not published yet, showed that by implementing the positivity criteria that we've used for the Luminex, searching thus uh, simultaneously positivity to two different antigen of COVID-19 uh, on 86 uh, positive, 84 presented uh, neutralizing antibodies. So if we use this criteria and we implement it, we will be able to see that uh, for a population, uh, several prevalence is uh, 50 percent, but 40 percent of these can be immune. But these are still hypotheses for the moment. Thank you very much, Antoine, for these answers. Really clear and pertinent for Salah, who is uh, the uh, driver of this uh, survey. One uh, question of uh, from John Paul: What were what were the criteria for intervention of MSF? And uh, there are other surveys linked to malaria, to nutrition. What are the criteria implemented for these kind of surveys? Hello. So, hello. Thank you very much. Now, in respect to the criteria for intervention of Doctors Without Borders, as I said in the beginning, uh, we had this uh, will to carry out uh, these uh, surveys in order to uh, know how to uh, organize our intervention. Otherwise, uh, the person uh, who asked the question uh, mentions all the interventions, all the operations that have been carried out, and there I could answer on how we could uh, respond uh, to a given context in respect to a situation. First of all is the capacity of the state and the Ministry of Health to manage the problem or they do not have any further capacity. And in this case, uh, MSF can help them and support them, uh, broadening the spectrum, the, the, the broadening the operation and uh, the capacity to respond to people. And also we want to work in prevention. Prevention is really important, especially in respect to all the prevention measures that have been implemented, that are implemented through uh, sensibilization, uh, care, surveilling the evolution of the disease with all the mutations that we see today. I think we need to work a lot more on uh, prevention allowing us to protect better uh, the people. So the intervention criteria are not measured on the results of um, these uh, surveys. We could say that today we need uh, KIF priority uh, following the trends that we've seen on people uh, who are at higher risk, we need to pay a lot more attention to that, but also to follow the following the evolution of the disease, we need to look more to the decentralization system uh, of uh, health uh, cares in respect to this disease. So being that for uh, taking care of people, but also for prevention, for treating people, but also for prevention for in the health centers in the outskirts of these settlements and cities. We need to adapt the operational strategy following the evolution of the disease. So I will stop here uh, about the strategy because uh, 
it is difficult to answer this question, but I don't know if uh, the person that asked this question is satisfied with the reply I could give. Thank you very much, Salah. I will take now one last question for Professor Gouro. Isabel is uh, thanking everybody for the really clear presentation. So do you think that in the region where several prevalence is high, we could envisage a vaccination with one unique dose of vaccine in order to, um, to, to support the logistic, to make it easier for the logistic? Thank you very much for the question. We do have a problem, and the problem is on the type of tests that have been carried out. Some said it, we cannot, on the basis of uh, several prevalence with these tests, estimate the level of protection of the population. The aim of vaccination is to to, to create an immunity. And the antibody that we find here cannot tell us anything on the actual protection. It's really difficult to see, uh, to uh, think up a model. And the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the question would be there, do we have to test people before we uh, vaccinate them? And we've been told it's not necessary to know if they've already been sick in order to vaccinate them. And as we are learning right now, there are there is no formal answer. There is no justified argument. Um, it's not because several prevalence is low in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in is higher in a country that we have to vaccinate with only one dose. But of course, it is a question that uh, deserves to be thought upon and uh, studied with maybe uh, surveys uh, that can inform us on the level of uh, protection of a population. In this case, we could be able to start to envisage this hypothesis, but also with the cross reaction and with others, and knowing also that there are people who have been sick and are sick again, there are, there are people who've been vaccinated and still got sick, so there is not a solid science behind this yet. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It's uh, 10 past. We've had several answers to our question, many questions that still do not need an answer. The story continues. There will be certainly a new wave, a new variant, the Omicron, that seems to be more transmissible. And so there will be time and opportunity to create and uh, to devise and to implement other surveys to track not only the disease, but also the variants in the different continents. And of course, in the African continent, uh, there is uh, there are possibilities and uh, challenges to to see mixing of different variants and viruses, and maybe we could implement a genomic surveillance to see how population have responded to this. So I'd like for the moment to thank everybody for having taken part to uh, this uh, webinar, the panelists, our translators, and uh, Celine, who helped a lot in the organization of this webinar. And I'd like uh, to uh, say to all of you, have a nice day and see you soon at the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.